We'll get started because um, everyone's coming in still, but just good morning and, and welcome everyone to a back, back to another webinar. Um, my name is Jess from Best Farming Systems and today we're lucky enough to have both Luke and Zoe um, from Regen Farming as panellists today. And also joining us is Michael Gooden. Um, he works with RCS Australia. Michael also owns a cattle stud. Um, and he'll just be talking a bit about his experience with grazing management. Um, I'll just quickly go through a bit of housekeeping. So we are recording the webinar and I'll make it available hopefully within the next few days um, to send out to everyone. We're also just gonna make sure to hold questions till the end. We'll let kind of Michael and Zoe do a bit of their talking, but we do ask, there's just a question and answer box down the bottom there that you can type your questions in. It's just easier for us to keep track of if we have them all in that Q&A box. Um, and yeah, so when, and is there anything else you need to add on top of that, Luke? Yeah, just uh, once again, I'd just really like to thank uh, Best Farming Systems for helping us out to run these things and get the get, get this knowledge out and, um, and help everybody with different tools. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Michael and Zoe also for coming on today and, um, and RCS for helping us out. Uh, all right, Michael, um, we'll let you uh, go through your presentation. Yeah, excellent, Luke. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be able to present. I'm uh, coming to everyone this morning from sunny Coonabarabra, and there was a frost up here this morning. And uh, I had the pleasure of driving yesterday from, I was started in Cobar, but went Wenaring, Burke, Bawara and Walgut and back to Coonabarabin. So I got to see a bit of the northwest of New South Wales, which doesn't usually happen for me. It was yeah, pretty exciting to see some of the landscape. Some of it's uh, performing better than others, but yeah, it was a really good trip. I'll just share my screen and then we'll get into this presentation. There we go. Can everyone see that all right? Good, yep. Yeah, excellent. All right. So, yeah, I'm Michael Gooden. I work with RCS and also we run a, um, a family farm, Old Man Creek Grass Fed Bulls. Um, it's my, well, that photo is actually a little bit out of date. It's amazing how out of date it is. Uh, that's my family of three kids, my wife, Eloise. Um, it's probably why we get out of bed every day. Uh, our goal is to be custodians of the landscape that has the capacity to reach its true potential. We want to manage, uh, uh, we want our management to profitably enhance our landscape's ability to utilise every ray of sunlight and drop of moisture in a way nature intended. Our vision for our landscape is, uh, is to manage it so it's hard to see where Earth finishes and the universe begins. So that's some of the context of how we're operating in and some, uh, based around some of the decisions that we try to make. Where we're located, uh, we're basically located in uh, southern East of Wales. Um, 70 kilometres west of Wagga, 30 k's east of Narendra, in the, in the Riverine, or genuinely on the Riverine Plains, our, our property's uh, very flat and uh, it's got sort of veins that go through it of uh, flood, flood country that run through the property. From an RCS perspective today, we always really like to talk of the analogy of the three-legged pot. Uh, we're probably going to be focusing a lot on production uh, today from a grazing management production perspective. But it's always really mindful that we need to be thinking of our land, our production and our business. Uh, if we don't get those things in balance, then the pot gets wobbly and the people fall out. And so we want to be mindful of any time we're making decisions that we need to be considering those three legs of the pot. Uh, this is the property. Uh, Willow Lees, 388 hectares. Uh, is, of which 130 is uh, lasered irrigation, flood irrigation, and there's about 65 hectares that sort of gets pretty well affected uh, with a lot of local uh, flood water and flood water out of the Murrumbidgee flood floodplain system. So we have to manage that uh, accordingly. We it's 100% grazing operation. The irrigation we use for to grow perennial grasses and annual grasses. But the whole the whole area is all uh, under cells, and um, so we just manage it as, as one sort of grazing cell. Now this is the uh, the property from a subdivision perspective. Uh, all these paddocks we don't have physical fences in all the in all those areas. Our our 
uh, properties fenced down to a sort of about 24 main paddocks, ranging from 10 to 40 hectares. But what we use is we use temporary um, electric fencing, which will show in a tick, to be able to subdivide these paddocks down. Why this map is the way it is, is it gives us uh, an, an ability to measure the yield from these areas when livestock are grazing those areas. So we've got very accurate measurement of uh, how many days of grazing the areas have had and then how much dry matter has been removed. And that gives us an ability to make some really good decisions based on what's happening in the paddock, what, what, what we've done, what treatments we've made in the paddock and then what the outcome of that has occurred. Uh, this is an overlay of the watering system. We've got uh, 14 kilometres of underground uh, 63 mil poly pipe and 45 outlets. So basically, as you can see there, within sort of 100, 150 metres anywhere on the property, we've got a watering point. And then with the temporary electric fencing, we can um, have stock basically anywhere in the up to a sort of two to three hectare area at, at, at any point in time on the property. So this gives us incredible flexibility with our grazing management. Uh, so yeah, everything's, everything's portable, in, including the livestock. There's a Kiwi Tech uh, portable fencing that we have set up on the old Can Air motorbike. It's just about on its last legs at the moment, but we're, um, we're sort of trudging on with that. But it's a fully portable, fully electric uh, one pass operation. And we've been using this since about 2011. And some of the stuff we've got is, you know, the original posts and wires that we've been using for 12 years. We've turned a bit of it over over the years, but it's incredibly resilient and uh, works really well in our situation. As you can see from the background there, the majority of our land's sort of flat and open. And so that gives us that flexibility. Uh, we've got really good access around the place. There's no real dramas driving a motorbike around. The, especially all the irrigation area is all very flat and open and very little trees. So that gives us that flexibility to be able to basically put a paddock up wherever we need or a cell up wherever we need it. Uh, I'll just show a little video here, of, uh, a, a sample of me putting out the fence. Uh, so this is, we usually will sort of work on about, yeah, two minutes, three minutes per hundred meters to pull up or take down. There's not a lot of difference in the speed that it takes to put a fence up or take a fence down. Uh, what the, the really good thing with the Kiwi Tech that once you've got it on the power pack on the motorbike like we've got is that it allows you to do the uh, job in one pass. So you start at one end and then you, you uh, tie the wires on and you go travel right through, put the posts in, put the fence out uh, and you travel to the other end and you do it all in one pass. You don't have to go back and flick wires in or pull posts up or anything like that. You can do it in, in one quick pass. And that you know becomes very efficient um, way to put a fence up quickly and easily. So we can make paddocks, yeah, anywhere up to you know smallest of half a hectare up to well you know forty hectare paddock and anywhere in between. So we're we're making that decision based on uh, the feed that's in the paddock and then how long we want the animals to be in there, and that so we've got a lot of flexibility in and around. Um, yeah, how, how big an area that we make. So this now is, I, this is me now taking it down. I don't usually have two Labradors with me all the time, but when I got this filmed, the guy who does some work for me, he's got a Labrador and I've got a Labrador and Labradors are like that. If they think they're going to miss out on something, they want to be involved. So they sort of come out. <laughs> That's usually not what occurs. So that, this is pulling the posts out of the ground, uh, the wires flick off, um, yeah, it all happens all in one pass. So that's, that was about 380 metres that this video uh, is taken off. And as you can see in the background there, we front straight onto the Sturt Highway. So we've got um, really good access into the property, but then on the other side of that is everyone can see what we're up to as well. So yeah, those wires flick off and you just pull the posts out of the ground. There is a post puller on the, on the bike, uh, which works pretty well, but I tend to find I'd like to just pull the posts out myself. Some people use the post puller, but um, yeah, I'm sort of been doing it long enough now just to get the post to come out. 
Now, the first thing most people say, oh, that's very, that's fine, that'll work for cattle, but uh, we can't keep sheep behind uh, a two-wire fence. So this is an example of some lambs behind the two-wire fence. Uh, I'll play that there now. I hope these videos are coming through reasonably well. Um, now, this is not a good example of grazing management. This is an example of what happens, uh, a communication breakdown between me being about 15, 18 hours late into move, move the mob. So you can see I've severely overgrazed the area, but uh, the wire is still actually keeping these lambs in. See a little, yeah, I don't know if that came through, but the lamb gets hit by the wire, jumps off the fence and moves half the mob. So yeah, you can, you know, a little bit of effort and training. You can train um, livestock to the hot wires very well. We used a, a earth return um, system that, yeah, it's all linked in back to a mains energizer. Um, and so we're getting really good power through the wires and that's allowing us to, those wires are pretty hot. And if the animals touch it, they get a really good whack, which is, I think is extremely important in setting up the electric fence. Our water, this is an example of our stock water, just a portable trough. It's sort of custom made. I basically copied it off the Kiwi Tech poly trough, but we had some issues with it just they were breaking over after a little while. So we make, went to a fully 100 uh, stainless steel, 100 litre trough with a handsome uh, diaphragm float valve in it. Uh, now we just move this along uh, each each time we're moving the mob along. So you're probably moving sort of 100, 150 metres each time along, just hook it on behind the motorbike, drag it forward as you move the stock along. And also out on the irrigation, we use this portable shade structure, which we sort of made on farm, it's 17 by 10 metres, can fit about 100 head underneath it. Uh, and you can see there that, the, you know, the cattle usually tend to, if, there's, if that's available, they'll go and use it. If there's trees available, they'll probably use the trees over the portable shade, but when there's no nothing else, they'll use the portable shade really well. Um, one of the other little intangible things with the portable shade that we've sort of seen since is it creates a really small area of very high density grazing. Um, we've had some really interesting results uh, um, after like where the shade has been. A couple of times this summertime, we sort of spread out a bit of um, multi species mix under these little shade areas. And we've had some areas that have come up with all sorts of things uh, underneath that shade area with that really high density grazing. Um, mathematically, if we we don't use the shade all year round. This time of year, when it's cooling down now, we don't tend to move it around. But um, yeah, we use, there's about three and a half, four hectares of, of area that that shade cover would cover across our property if we move it every day of the year um, through the high density grazing. So it, it will add up over time. I'll just, this, this is a video of me moving the, the shade. Uh, once again, my wife Ellie was out giving me a hand to film, um, and this happens probably about oh, one or two in ten times that the wire gets caught on the bike, and so of course it happens the time that we filmed it. But it's all designed to. Um, this is being towed over one of the Kiwi Tech wires, um, so those wires just slip underneath the wheels and underneath the water trough, um, and then that's a little supplement trail that we have on the back there. Just yeah, we're big fans of feeding out um, the Himalayan rock salt to the animals. Um, yeah, in when things get quite dry and we've got very little green feed, then we'll we'll transition the cows onto um, a higher urea mix to keep that um, the rumen bugs turning over and um, give them access to the bypass protein to break down the dry feed. So we just play that by year with uh, how the season's panning out. So yeah. That's a supplement trailer, just yeah, another homemade job. One of these things, uh, we our main enterprise is growing our bulls and their number one aim in life, well, hopefully the number one aim in life is to get cows pregnant, but their next aim in life is to break things. And so we've had, we try and make things as strong and as sturdy as they can be. Uh, so that, yeah, they're yielding bullproof and hence why we've got a stainless steel water trough and a pretty heavy duty supplement trailer so that, yeah, they can survive the rigours of, of uh, inquisitive yearling bull. Uh, the other thing that we use, I'm on the road of reasonable amount with my work with RCS. So we use the remote monitoring of our watering points. 
Um, here's some pictures here that the pictures on the left-hand side are looking at the camera and seeing that's what it is, just a little Arlo 3G camera, pretty simple. Um, and then the other pictures are the, a picture taken from the camera looking out into the paddock. It's amazing. It gives a pretty clear image uh, and you can see, ideally see what the water troughs up to, but also, you know, more and more now I'm seeing it looking at the paddock and seeing, you know, am I, am I happy with the amount of feed that, that is in there? It's um, also, it's a really great way of keeping an eye on Kevin, the guy who works for me, so I can see what he's been up to. If I'm, if I'm uh, up in northwest New South Wales, I can uh, see if he's moved the cattle yet or not, or if he's doing burnouts on the motorbike. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm, this, the rest of this presentation is going to be about implementing the um, RCS6 regenerative grazing principles. Uh, these have been developed over sort of 30, 40 years of, uh, of um, knowledge through RCS and their clients, and um, they're very rigorous. I think the, what we're going to do is I'm going to present, present how our interpretation of how we uh, implement these on, in our property, with a focus being on grazing the multi species. Uh, crops uh, in a you know in a high intensity way. So the first grazing principle is uh, plan, monitor, and manage our managing our grazing. Um, we'll run through these uh, individually uh, after this, and then the second is to adjust uh, adjust the rest period to suit the growth rate of the plant. So if the plant's growing quickly, then we need to be moving quickly. Um, Probably, well, it's number three, but it's extremely important. If you get the first two right, it's very simple, but matching stocking rate to carrying capacity. Uh, that's if, When you get that one right, then all these other things fall into place. So that's making sure you, you understand the difference between what the supply of the feed that you've got on hand is and then the, what the demand from the animals is. They're basically uh, in opposition to each other, uh, and we need to be trying to match that as, as, as best as we can. And managing livestock effectively is making sure that we've got, you know, we're calving and lambing in the correct times of the years. We've got the correct type of livestock on the correct type of feed. We're, you know, not trying to fatten cows uh, over the summer or we're not, you know, we, if we've got high value feed, well, then we're using a high value animal to be utilising that. Um, then the number five is maximum stock density for minimum time. Uh, it's, it's a really um, powerful tool but it's number five for a reason. We really need to be making sure that we get those top four uh, principles nailed down and, and humming along really well before we even sort of think about the density stuff. You can make some really big gains with, with high density, but also you can really do some damage if you don't get it properly. Uh, and then managing for diversity. I think this is one of these things where the multi-species really fits in because uh, that allows us to in, in, introduce more diversity uh, through different plants over the top, but then also we know that that's going to increase the soil biology and the diversity of biology underground as well. So that's a really powerful um, and really important um, principle to implement. So yeah, this is us grazing some multi-species crops. This was taken in probably August, September last year. This crop was actually sown probably a little bit on the later side. It was sown in May. Um, and it just sown straight over the top of an existing winter pasture that had sort of turned off. And we grazed it reasonably hard just with animals a couple of times, and then we sowed straight in. Um, now, so this is usually traditionally what sort of happens out our way is we've got you know, a lot of our country was split up into sort of 640 square mile, um, 260 hectare paddocks. And if you're lucky, there's a dam in the corner um, and I'm actually going to be really generous in this situation and think the old mate split it up and um, there's actually two dams and we've got two 340 acre paddocks. So if we were going to go into this situation and look at grazing it, uh, our utilisation is going to be really poor because you'll get, you know, two or 300 metres out from that uh, watering point. The animals will graze pretty well, especially, you know, if you've got a high value multi-species crop they're going to be reasonable amount of feed on offer. So basically they'll overgraze all the areas around the watering points and then it'll be weeks and weeks until they get out uh, further into the paddock and by then you'll miss the opportunity to, to graze appropriately the, the rest of the feed out further. Um, so this is sort of one of the things that we've really looked in implementing is um, splitting these paddocks up using the Kiwi Tech fencing. Uh, so this in this example, you know, it's a 1,600 metre uh, square mile, um, which basically allows us to go into 400 metre cells. 
and then uh, 400 by 1600 meters, which is sort of 65 hectares um, paddock. Um, and then, you know, we're imaginingly throwing in the watering system, very similar to what we've got on our place, uh, sort of, yeah, depending on your stock numbers and how it was sitting in the rest of the property. But, you know, you really want to be working on that two to three litres a second of flow rate so that you've got the capacity for all those animals to get a drink when they need. Um, so in this situation, if we were looking at, um, you know, sowing a winter cereal, um, now I'll just pick these numbers sort of from what we've sort of done. Every situation and every season is going to be a little bit different, but we've just got to start somewhere. So we're looking at um, a 90 days um, cycle length. So from when you start 90 days of grazing, sowing on the 15th of March, um, 60 days to actually get up and get out of the ground before we start grazing it. And then we're going to lock it up, you know, in fifth, in the middle of August, 15th of August. Um, so in this situation, if we had just the four paddocks, um, well, you have 90, if you had just had the one big paddock, you'd have 90 days of grazing and that'd be it. Um, by going to the sort of the four paddocks, then we're looking at sort of 22 days grazing in each, in each 65 uh, hectare area. Um, so even in that period of time, you still you, there's going to be overutilisation in some spots and underutilisation in others. Um, so just just try and think about what we're trying to achieve. We're really trying to grow as much dry matter as we possibly can in that time of year, and then also utilise it as a, as effectively as we can. Um, what we want to be really mindful of is that we want to be able to leave some leaf area on those plants so that that has the ability to be able to regrow. So in this example, I'm sort of saying, well, we're going to set ourselves a target to graze each area sort of twice in that 90 day period. Um, obviously, you don't graze it all on day one. So some of it's going to be, it's going to take a little while to get through the cycle. You'll start off probably a little bit earlier than ideal. And then by the time you finish that cycle, um, the, the first area will well and truly recover. Um, just for people who aren't, well, yeah, familiar with it, um, we like to have to measure things in sort of dry sheep equivalent. So dry sheep is uh, 50 kilogram weather at maintenance. And the beauty of it is the guy who came up with uh, um, the measurement for the DSC, it also, it, it equates to one kilo of dry matter. So if you're looking at assessing a paddock of how much feed is available, uh, that you can flip that around into DSC days a hectare relatively easily. Uh, the caveat on that is um, traditionally, you know, from the pro-graze perspective, they've been looking at sort of taking everything. We're not really wanting to take everything. We're wanting to leave a reason that a leaf area behind. So we probably don't really like coming below, say, 2,000 kilos of dry matter. Um, but if you've got 4,000 in the paddock, well, then you've got 2,000 that's available. So, um, yeah, kilo of dry matter is still with one DSC, but we're probably not wanting to take it back to, you know, below 500 or, or below, yeah. 2,000 in a lot of ways. So in our situation, as you saw, we're looking at putting in some of these fences, um, putting them in across um, to be able to concentrate the animals in this area. Now, I'll just go back to this. So yeah, they, it's, um, it, it, just a matter of, it's a matter of just calculating out mathematically what animals you've got in their mob, uh, how much feed's available, and then work doing the maths on, on your area. So. Um, yeah, a hectare is 100 by 100 metres, or, you know, in this situation, 400 metres wide by 25 gives you your hectare. So you just split it out to see uh, how big an area you need for that for that number of animals for that day. Um, we use, I use an app called Field Area Measure that works out pretty well. Um, there's a few other ones that are available. And so that type of thing, until you start getting your eye in, it's really handy just to actually physically go out on the bike and just measure those areas out. And then that keeps a track of how big the area is. Um, the cool part about this is you get this feedback loop coming around. So if you have underestimated or overestimated the area, it's only a matter of a couple of days till you find out that whether you were right or wrong with that um, estimation. So this is just a few examples. The credit um, this photo on the left from Cole Sizes place up near Goolagong. And then the one on the right, I think, is from Steve Scott near Henty. But this is just a bit of a visual how much feed is there. Um, these pictures are pretty hard to see, I suppose, from, uh, yeah, on the Zoom. But you soon get a bit of a gauge of how much feed is in the paddocks. Um, so we're talking the DDH is DSC days a hectare. So that's how much um, food is available. Now, that, 
that's a different measurement to how many kilos of dry matter are there. If you're going getting your progress measurement out, um, your kilos of dry matter would be higher. But when we're talking about DSC days a hectare, that's putting your sheep or cow hat on and thinking, right, oh, if I was a sheep or cow, how much food am I going to want to eat in this area? And also then be able to leave enough behind to let the plant recover and, and grow, grow away again. Um, so yeah, this is th these are just a bit of an example of a few different, um, different feed amounts. Now I know it's only sort of, it's only 10 o'clock where I am, but one of the things that uh, quick and easy that we like to sort of think about, and I've stolen this from Jim Gerrish um, about how much should we look at trying to remove. So quick and dirty is probably go from a long neck to a stubby in terms of the feed that is in the paddock to how much you want to leave behind. Um, so that's that sort of, yeah, how much is in there? How much do we want to take out um, per grazing? This here is an example of um, the paddock we were in last year. So I've estimated that there was sort of 2,200 DSE days a hectare of feed there. And then based on the number of animals in the mob and their production state and the time that they were in there, then we removed 850 DDH removed. And in this example, this and this is what's so powerful from our situation, because I believe we probably took out about 250 DDH too much in this uh, in this picture. And looking at that, for me, I'm hoping it's coming up reasonably clear on in your presentation, but we've probably taken those plants back a little bit too much, not as much leaf area there as we want. Um, and yeah, so that's just going to slow down the, the recovery of those plants and I don't have the images here, but that was the case. So the area that of that 850 DDH there was about two hectares out of a 15 hectare paddock. Um, and so, you know, when we moved into that next area, the area that's on the left, then we could um, shorten our grazing time up and then so not take out as much. And visually we can see quite easily the difference in the recovery uh, in those, on those two sides. Um, yeah, so this here, this is probably getting to the bit of the nuts and bolts about um, what we'd look at trying to do from a paddock layout. So in this situation, we've got um, given, we've got eight he hectares, uh, which is 400 by 200 metres. I've assessed that there's going to be 850 DDH uh, in the paddock. Um, so that equates to then um, 6,800 uh, DSE days um, for this grazing period. So, and in this example, we've we've said, right, oh, we've got 100, uh, 320 kilo steers. Now, I always pick 320 kilo steers growing at a kilo a day because they are 10 DSE. Um, and yeah, so obviously not everyone's always just got that exact number, but for the purpose of this example, that's what we've been able to um, use and pick. So that in this situation, then that'll, the eight by eight, uh, eight hectare area uh, with the assessment of um, 850 DSE days a hectare is going to last those animals for seven days. Um, so yeah, you're, we're going to get significantly more grazing out of this, out of this 260 hectare cell by being able to subdivide these paddocks up and then we'll get a better recovery from the area that's been grazed. Uh, and then you probably potentially get more out of the grazing by the time you come back around again. Uh, depending on how much, uh, in how intensively you want to go and what the what the plan is with the paddock. If it's a genuine uh, grain recovery situation where you want to be very vigilant on the lockup time and whether you're going to be taking out your broad leaves uh, as well in there. Um, but this will give you a little bit of flexibility. You have sort of 20 or 30 days difference between the paddocks on the left or the paddocks on the right, um, those 65 hectare paddocks, depending on which way you've grazed. So by going and putting a bit more intensive grazing in there, you're giving yourself a lot more flexibility, depending on the season and what else is happening on the rest of the property, your other perennial grasses, you might decide that um, you keep one of these paddocks in, graze it out completely, and the other three could go to grain production or something like that. So it's just providing you with a lot more flexibility once you start getting a little bit more intense. But conversely too, if you think that right over can't be asked moving 
fences every day, well, then you potentially got the, uh, the option to, um, to be able to make those paddocks bigger. Um, with this split up design here, one of the things that we found works really well is to give yourself at the top and the bottom of every paddock um, plenty of room to get for your machinery operation. So you can go around with your boom spray unfolded or your, and your cedar and you've got room there for trucks and chaser bins to be turning. Um, and another example that we've uh, seen is where the guy actually had, um, you know, a gap in the middle of the paddock too. So he could basically had a laneway going up through the middle and um, that's where his, um, his operations were occurring from. His load, trucks were being loaded out of and mother bin was being situated. So at the end of the day, with beauty with a bit of technology nowadays, you can make sure these fences go in on your GPS line, you're getting them in nice and straight, and you're really only missing about a metre or so of that paddock um, with that area going through. Uh, another guy, we've seen, he put the fences in um, so they're only about 400 mils off the ground for grazing of the cattle, and um, he just sprays straight over the top of them. So he doesn't really even know that they're there. They're obviously out of the way for... The machinery operation and then he just straight um, sprays straight over the top. Um, if you wanted to get really serious you could take those fences out um, that, and then crop the other way. Um, yeah, yeah there's a reasonable amount of flexibility there depending on what you're trying to do. And so this is yeah getting back to implementing these, these uh, re regenerative grazing principles. So the first principle is um, plant monitor and manage. Um, so that's, you know, what we've just been discussing about grazing the multi-species winter crop is having that plan, you know, when am I going to, what am I sowing, what am I trying to achieve with it, uh, how much, you know, are we going to utilise that extra dry matter with our existing stock, are we going to bring in livestock for it, um, all those types of decisions. Probably also too, you know, how much grazing do we need to get off it, is it going to be profitable, what are we going to be trying to achieve, how are we utilising the extra feed that we're growing. And do we need to be growing that extra feed in the first place? Which is one of these decisions that we're probably asking ourselves at the moment. Uh, so yeah, also monitoring, how much am I removing? Are we happy with the growth rate that's occurring? Um, you know, have we got enough feed ahead of us? Are we gonna be able to get back around um, and graze the, the what we've already grazed the second time appropriately? Uh, up in the top right corner there is the dung score. We're really big fans of uh, monitoring the dung. Uh, even on these winter multi species, we're really big fans of having a bit of that dry summer feed still in there because that holds the cattle up, stops the feed going through them as much, and increases their um, productivity. So yeah, we, if it's just all big lush green uh, ripe feed, it, they're probably not getting the production off them. It, that feed might be going through. If you've got some drier feed in there, and I think the diversity really adds to that as well, and um, that helps with the animal performance. Um, we use the Maya Grazing app to be able to measure the uh, dry matter, the yield of each paddock for each graze, and then also measures our recovery period. And we can plan out ahead, you know, 60, 90, 120 days um, where we're headed with our grazing. Uh, this is the grazing chart coming out of Maya. So this is these little blue bars are uh, representing um, the paddocks are down the left hand side, and the blue bars are the grazing um, periods uh, for each area. And so you can sort of see the area there where it's blocked out is an area where we've potentially gone and set stock animals for a period of time. Um, and then, you know, then they'll move on back to being on the move again. Uh, principle number two, adjust rest period to suit the growth rate of the plant. So that's basically in and around understanding that, you know, as a plant's germinating, it's a seedling and it's using its root reserves to push that leaf out. So we don't really want to be grazing it at that point in time. Um, and then it, goes into phase two, which then it starts photosynthesizing and it's using the energy from the sun to then start growing. And that's when we want to really, that's when we can really start grazing the plant. So we want to be grazing at what we call the top of phase two. Um, so grazing it and taking it back down to the bottom of phase two and then letting it recover, grazing it again and doing that pulsing a couple of times throughout that growing season to really optimize that growth. It's uh, really good for the roots of the plant that's trimming those roots and they're regrowing again. So it's stimulating the soil biology um, and then keeping that plant nice and productive. And ultimately then that plant is gonna go into phase three, but we want it to be locking it into phase three so that's reasonably quality feed um, to reduce that lignification. Um, for us down this way, our part of the world, the lignification is not as big an issue as it is sort of up in, when you get up into those really uh, big grasses up in central Queensland, but. Um, yeah, still something we need to be really mindful of. 
the scale that we operate at, we're more than happy to um, use some urea to be able to help reduce that lignification. Um, the other part of the thing that we can really do, especially with the temporary wires, is um, when the grass starts growing really quickly, instead of sort of having two or three hectare paddocks, we can go to five or eight, ten hectares really quickly just by not putting up as many fences. So that, that can allow us to move across our country really quickly when the grass starts growing um, fast. And that sort of happened this summer, really. We had all this rain, you know, like a lot of other people. And so it was very unseasonal for us to be growing as much grass as we did sort of that January, February period. So we just started moving really quickly and it allowed us to get around our place pretty quickly and take the top off all this grass. And you're basically getting a free feed because that, you know, especially the conditions that we had that January, February, the grass was growing so quickly that by the time we got back around to where we were, you could sort of hardly tell that we'd been there. That, you know, we've got, you know, 60, 60 odd days of feed that just you didn't even know where the cattle had been, which was really great in, in, in a season like we're having. Um, the principle number three is matching our stocking rate to cane capacity. This is extremely important uh, from an ecological perspective, from a stress management perspective, and from an animal performance perspective. So on this graph here, we've got the blue line is, or well, the blue bars is our monthly rainfall. Um, this is a little bit out of date. This is a screenshot taken in September last year. Um, and then the green line is our actual carrying capacity, the animals that we've got on the property. And then the black line that goes through the middle is what we call our benchmark carrying capacity. So that's our sort of where we want, where we feel comfortable with the amount of animals that we're running on the property at any one time. So ideally for us, um, if you look back to the left-hand side there, you can see that January, February uh, uh, 2019, we were severely overstocked. Um, in that situation, we'd actually had animals in confinement, but they, they were on the property and so that was, um, yeah, they were being shown up as, um, yeah, being there. But um, then we made, we sold animals down and, and then started growing more grass. And, you know, basically ever since then, we've been tracking along to be matching that stocking rate to can capacity um, pretty well. It's been an incredible sort of 18 months, two years. So um, for us, yeah, it's been really mindful to not only, um, you know, be able to match it when things are getting dry, but then also match it when things are getting wet. So we, you know, we're running more stock than we've had for a long time at the moment because you know, our seasonal conditions are really good. Um, and matching stocking rate to current capacity also is, um, you know, what did I plan to, how many, how many animal days did I plan on taking out of the area? Um, what actually happened? Um, and then am I happy with that result? And then do I need to replant? So the beauty of using the subdivision and the small paddocks is you're getting that answer, you know, you're getting back to almost being a dairy farm, and you, um, you get those, that answer within a couple of days. So, you know, did I estimate, how much food did I estimate to remove? Uh, was, was, did I take out more or less than what I wanted? And then, you know, do I need to make the next area bigger or larger? And what's that going to do, you know, for the next 30 days if I do have to make the plan bigger? Have I got enough stock on or do I need more stock? Um, so you're getting that feedback loop really quickly and we can make decisions, um, yeah, with a, you know, greater degree of uh, accuracy and also you can make them a lot quicker. If you're just picking, you know, 30 steers in a 25 hectare paddock, well, it'll take you 10 days to work out whether they're eating more or less than what you thought. If you stick those same amount of animals in a two hectare area within 48 hours, you've got that answer of, you know, how, how much feed are we estimated? So then you can make a decision based on that. Managing livestock effectively. So that's all about sort of the, that's, you know, making money out of it. And we've got the right type of animal. Are they grazing the right type of feed? Um, you know, are we lambing and calving at the right time of year? Are they in good health? Have they got the, uh, the nut nutritional requirements being met? Are they um, free of diseases and viruses and all that type of thing? Um, so yeah, just making sure that you're getting that production element of it very uh, well. It's it's a it's that sort of conversion of your grass into into money, which is extremely important. There's no point having the best pasture in the world. You've got to be utilising that and turning that into dollars and cents. So that's managing livestock effectively becomes really important. Um, we're really big fans of measuring the dung score. Uh, we've got a few different samples here. Uh, the top, well, the middle one is basically was sort of what we're really looking for. It's that pavlova type of thing. Um, and then on the top picture is probably a little bit on the runny side, on the left-hand side. Uh, and the bottom right is, is um, 
that's a dung that's you know sort of starting to clump up pretty well and an animal like that would probably be looking at um supplementing with urea through the supplement trailer to help improve that bypass protein um, you can see in those pictures the background there that's the, all those images have been taken when it's reasonably dry so that's you know once you've got if you can see visible green feed around that green feed's going to be higher in protein and that's going to really aid to the rumen digestion um, so yeah once we really start running out of green feed that's when we look at that supplementation this time of year um yeah we're probably on the other side of it trying to see if we've got enough dry feed in our pasture stand to be um not letting it run through them too much which it's actually one of the upsides to having such a big summer we grew a lot of feed and then a couple of frosts we've had that's all dried off so our pasture at the moment is actually holding up really well really happy with the animal performance um the stock density maximum stock density for minimum time um we've done this from time to time it's it's you've got to be really have yourself cut out for it it's pretty intensive and probably doesn't always tick the box of you know is this what we're wanting to be doing um moving animals three or four times a day uh it's great in a lot of ways you can get some good benefits from it but then also you've got to be really mindful of you know the energy and effort that it takes to do um are you doing it with the right class of stock uh, are you happy with their performance what's the ecological outcome you're trying to achieve um so yeah it's really is the horsepower with the grazing but you've just got to be really mindful about uh, how you, you don't want to be doing it you know 365 days of the year um you, you'll sort of yeah you, you probably won't enjoy it i'm managing for biodiversity again so yeah we've been a fan of the multi-species crops um yeah trying to add that diversity in we're also a fan of sort of grazing sheep and cattle when we can the beauty about the sheep and cattle side of it is that you know we're really trying to minimize the number of mobs that we always have on the property so we can maximize our recovery period um and so with the sheep and cattle you can always have two mobs in there and split them out really easily which is handy if you've got you know steers and heifers in there well it's nearly impossible to split them out so but if you've got sheep and cattle well you can always go and get if you need one or the other out to do something with um yeah you can get them out easy uh, also managing for diversity you know so throwing them sowing the multi species but also just the other the the ecological areas on the farm the, the sort of floodway area we've got we we graze in there but um just by not having the access the animals having access the whole time that really helps you know improve the other diversity for all the other critters that want to live on our place so yeah in summary um yeah this is the six grazing principles um so yeah plan monitor and manage our grazing adjust rest period to suit the growth rate of the plant uh, match stocking rate to carrying capacity uh, manage livestock effectively um make maximum stock density for minimum time and uh, manage for biodiversity we always get it right no this is um yeah what happens when you get a bit of high density um wrong but the, the thing about it is those areas have, have recovered really well which is really good um then yeah how do we know we're heading in the right direction um we're monitoring all the time this is some plant succession uh yeah we had a heap of pato come up after the drought and then it's all sort of disappeared now which is really good um any questions there i'll i'll stop my sharing thanks for that michael um we'll probably um go on to zoe now and have some questions after that uh so zoe uh works with me down and she looks after the um area down around store um and she's done rcs course does a bit of grazing management and those sorts of things so uh zoe do you just want to have a chat about your experience of uh what you've done and zoe's got her own farm as well so what you've done over the last um couple of years yeah, sure. Thanks, Luke. And thanks, best. Uh, thanks, Jess. It's um, a great opportunity just to uh, share what us little guys do. Uh, and um, thanks, Michael. Fantastic presentation. So uh, I have got a bit of a slideshow really quickly. So I might just pop this up um, for everyone to see. Um, and um, I'll just run through it and uh, we can. Um, uh from the beginning okay so we're at landsborough west uh which is uh halfway between ballarat and horsham um north of ararat if you like so on the edge of the wimmera 
and the Pyrenees ranges. So we've got self-replacing merino flock. We rear calves. Uh, we've got pasture-raised eggs uh, that you can see down there. And, um, and that's our little family that we traipsed up to the, to the top of the hill for uh, a very windy view. Um, and uh, the photo of the grass is basically our, our predominant winter grasses. Um, we've got low pea, we're quite acidic um, and uh, yeah, so we're small scale. We've only, we own ourselves 130 hectares, but we lease uh, a, a bit over 370 hectares, uh, which runs up to that big hill you can see in the background where the, the truck trailers are. So we uh, met Luke and uh, decided that we needed to try one of these multi-species cover crops uh, because we had identified some limiting factors. Um, so we wanted to take advantage basically of, of the um, any rainfall that we get. It does rain here in summer and I think we tend to forget that. Uh, so we really wanted to take advantage of any rain that falls obviously and uh, at the end of the day, we are sun catchers, so we are sun farmers. So uh, to try and, and photosynthesize uh, and get those plants working for us. Um, and obviously we had a, a, a major compaction issue. Uh, I think most soils across Australia do. So uh, which we've, we, we're starting to remedy that with um, multi-species. So, um, so this is last year's multi-species crop. Uh, you can see the uh, height that it got to obviously probably doesn't um, come back to uh, productivity and grazing correctly but we found ourselves with not enough stock. Uh, the crop got away uh, with quorum sensing. We, we used a biostimulant, uh, got, got things happening and then the quorum sensing took over and the, and the crop just basically went berserk. <laughs> uh, so we had too much feed. Uh, the little, um, which is which is a nice thing to have. Um, on the right we had a, that's a, I think a barley plant. It was about 18 days, I think, uh, post-germ, uh, post-germination. So you can see that, um, that great uh, rhizosphere starting there. Uh, the roots were covered. We were so impressed with that. So so we don't have a crimper um, and we had got to the point where we didn't have enough stock. Uh, we were uh, strip grazing it uh, with cattle and sheep. So we were running a flood. Um, so we set stock our ewes at lambing time. And then after lambing, uh, we put everything back together and we uh, graze um, graze in, a, in bigger mobs uh, in smaller areas. Uh, so the photo in the middle is, uh, and, and on the right, we actually, because we didn't have a crimper, used a couple of big tractor tyres chained together and we knocked the crop down. So uh, we, we're, as I said, we're only small fry, so we're not going to go out and and, uh, and buy anything too outlandish. So uh, we came up with the idea of just running the, the tire over it and it worked superb. Uh, we really had some fantastic results with it. Uh, kept that cover on the ground um, and yeah, really, really saw some great things. And obviously, of course, it's about reducing input costs. Uh, so, you know, we, we just wanted to make sure that we could uh, control the, the crop because we, we had too much feed and we had run into trouble and it was starting to senesce. So uh, on the left, uh, the, uh, that is just before we actually ran a header over some of the mouldy species uh, and collected some seed ourselves. So this is it here. Uh, in January, we just, uh, the neighbour pulled his header in and we ran over it with 20, about 20 acres, I think. Pulled about 15 ton off uh, and cleaned it up. Uh, so that's the sample there on the right. It was um, a fantastic sample uh, and we will just use that for ourselves. Um, it's not obviously for sale or anything, but we're just trying to uh, reduce, reduce costs. And uh, I guess one thing to point out here is that uh, obviously this, this paddock had gone to reproductive 
Uh, and we're now looking after that paddock again and grazing it correctly or better uh, and uh, using some foliar ferts on it uh, in the autumn. And uh, we've just, you can see um, the paddock down on the left with the little uh, foxy in the, in the photo. Um, that's the result of last year's uh, uh, cover crop. So, uh, so just quickly, just a, a few pointers on different grazing. Where the photo in the middle, where it's very patchy, uh, due to poor infrastructure, I suppose you can put it down to. Uh, perhaps we could say poor management. Uh, we overgraze that significantly with cattle, and uh, that is the result of what has come back. Uh, the photo down the bottom on the left hand side, that is literally the next frame across uh, where we managed it far better and uh, didn't do, uh, I think Michael said before, a bottle and a stubby uh, comparison. So I would suggest that perhaps the middle one was a crushed can, uh, which is not ideal and I don't suggest that you do that. Uh, just quickly on the right hand side, I'd like to make a point uh, the strip down the middle that you can obviously see, the drier, uh, the drier uh, biomass on the right hand side was not grazed and just knocked down with those tyres that we spoke that I spoke about, and on the left it was grazed with cattle and then knocked down. Uh, so you can see the difference there, uh, the increase in dry matter on the right. There is. Far more diversity on the left hand side though, uh, which is just an interesting um, talking point. And the paddock on the top left, that is the dark green on the left hand side is actually where our chook tractors have sat. So the chooks uh, are behind nets, uh, they get uh, approximately a hectare um, and they uh, are there for, they get moved every four to five days. So that increase in manure in that area uh, results in that. So you can see where there hasn't been any, uh, where, the, where the chook tractors and the chooks haven't been and that increase in manure uh, in the foreground and off to the right uh, is basically sorrel and erodium and, and, and those winter grasses I spoke about. And on the left hand side, we in, in, the, in that green, we've got all sorts of amazing things. And in summer, we even had plantain pop up, which we don't, you know, we've never planted and we don't have here. So, so we had some incre increase in diversity, which was fantastic. Uh, just another note here. So uh, the dark green on the left hand side, we had fed cattle along that area. And on the right hand side is the leftover of the multi species from last year that we're looking after. And interestingly, though, when we put the stock in here, this was a few weeks ago, we've just put the stock in a week ago, uh, they haven't actually gone for that taller, darker green stuff, which has been surprising. Um, still a lot of diversity in amongst that, but uh, taller and um, obviously uh, above this uh, above the long neck and a radish on the right uh, that was late autumn so we managed to uh, you know have fantastic summer rains and uh, that was the result so that radish there is about the size of a 1.25 litre coke bottle or soft drink bottle um, and yeah had had punched down into our compaction layer which is what we were aiming for so uh, so yeah that's um that's the big hill that we managed there. Uh, just like to, to make a, a, a few points just quickly. Um, so our soil health is basically everything we do here. It's always at the forefront of our minds. Um, and uh, eventually the, the aim is to get back to a perennial system, but we are using our multi-species um, and, and our holistic grazing uh, with electric fences up. One day we will aim for a Kiwi Tech system, but at the moment we we run out our our tapes, um, and we have no trouble with keeping uh, sheep or cattle behind. Um, and yeah, we'll integrate the livestock further into uh, where we um, move the move the chook caravans as well, uh, which then we can run more mouths across the uh, ground. Uh, and I guess uh, increased productivity as we're going. So 
um, yeah, I think hopefully that's uh, given some people an insight into, um, yeah, what, what we do and, and how you can go about it, I guess, uh, and thinking outside the box uh, and, and coming up with um, different ideas and, and really challenging those paradigms that, that we, we all have. So, yeah, so thank you. Thanks for that, Zoe. Um, so, thanks, thanks, guys, for sharing your knowledge, Michael and Zoe. So, we'll go into a few questions. I know I've written about half a dozen that I want to touch on, uh, and we've got four or five coming into the, the question um, box. Um, so, Michael, this one I think was directed towards yourself, but Zoe, you can answer that. Um, uh, Bruce was wondering how you... Um, calculate your rolling rainfall yeah so the rolling average rainfall is just basically your last 12 months rainfall so you can either do it on a month by month or day by day you know if it's daily you go back 365 days and every day you go forward you just drop that day off 365 days ago um so yeah it's just that we like to use it because it's a more accurate way of like year to date doesn't really mean a hell of a lot in a lot of ways because in january you don't have much and in december you've got a heap um, so, yeah, that 365 rolling rainfall is a thing that we like to uh, look at. And then I suppose always that's it's only in comparison then to what your long-term average is. So in our situation at the moment, our long-term average or our 30-year average rainfall at Willow Lee is 430 mils. And at the moment, I think it's about 800, 815. So it just shows how far above, you know, how good a season we're sort of having in that situation. So... On the, on the flip side of that is we want to be loaded up with livestock and utilising as much as we can because, you know, we're having one of these um, out-of-the-box seasons. And on the flip side, you know, 2019, I think we got down to 152 millimetres. So, um, yeah, we basically didn't, you know, we yeah, once again, matching our stocking rate to can capacity, hopefully. Yep, no worries. Uh, so the, Bruce has got quite a few here, but I'm going to throw in one of mine. Um, I, I show the photo of your trough to uh, people when I'm talking about um, about what you do, and they go, "Oh, geez, that only carry three or four bloody cows, and they'd it'd be no good." How many cows or how much livestock can you put on that little trough? Yeah, so I, I think the thing you need the, the, the paradigm, as Zoe sort of said, is about the water trough is about flow rate. So there's between two and three liters a second of water coming into that trough. Um, you can have probably five or six animals drinking from it, a cow's drinking from it at one time. Uh, but the thing about it is if they go and drink from it, um, they always get it a drink and then they'll go. So we've had sort of 300 head of cattle drinking off that water trough in the summertime, uh, which, yeah, that, you know, they've got to sort themselves out a little bit, but they do that. The most important thing is to always know that there's always water there when the animal goes there. It's cool, clean, fresh water. And that's the beauty of having that reticulated stock water system is, it's all underground, it's down 600 mils. Um, that water's coming out of 15 degrees, whether it's 45 degrees outside or whether it's, um, you know, one degree outside, it's still, it's basically like a big refrigerated water system. And um, so, yeah, those animals soon work out their pecking order. We have had an issue when we've had sheep and cattle running together. Sometimes the sheep were a bit iffy of going into the trough. Um, in that situation, I actually ran a second trough uh, with and had put a hot wire around it that the sheep could go underneath and the cattle couldn't. Um, that allowed the sheep to have access to their, their own water. Um, but, yeah, then another time I've had some other lambs and they didn't worry them. So I, I think you just need to be observant about what's going on. Yeah, no, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it really surprises people when I tell them how many cows that you do run off that, mm. off that trough. They go, oh, that's, this can't be done, but it obviously can. Um, so the other, another question here from Bruce is, um, is there any advantage of putting um, cattle into a paddock first and then followed by sheep or do you put them all in at once or what's, uh, what, what have you guys found to be um, best? Uh, I'll, I, I can briefly answer that. Look, I would prefer to run a flirt. Uh, I find the sheep just graze it so extremely hard if you're not on it. So uh, the, the cattle, you know, sort of, if you work on the, the theory of eat a, eat a third, trash a third, leave a third, uh, I think cattle are far better at that. But the sheep just strip everything and then you run out of that power of photosynthesizing. So I really, 
uh, I'd run a flirt and that's my, yeah, that we, we found the best with that. Yeah, I think also it depends on what the class of sheep are too, or, and or cattle for that matter. Like, so for instance, last year we had some second cross lambs that we wanted to, you know, put on 300 grams a day type of thing. So we were having them go ahead and they were getting the, literally the chocolate uh, and the cows were coming in behind. Um, but they were only about 25, 30% of our of the mob. Um, so that was in that leader follower type of thing. The thing you need to be quite mindful of that is how long your grazing period is. So we try and keep our grazing period sort of under four or five days so that we're not, there's very little chance of eating that, that sort of regrowth, that second shoot. Um, so, yeah, if you're running that two mobs, leader follower, you, it's, you know, the time, the grazing period is from the time the first animal came into when the last animal leaves that area. So that can blow out. If you've got two mobs grazing in there for five days each, well, that's a 10-day grazing period and you probably start to eat that that regrowth, especially if your sheep are the ones behind. Yep. So you just be mindful of that. Yeah. Yeah, so to follow on from that one, uh, Belinda Mills, uh, Zoe, um, the sequence of movement of uh, for your sheep, cattle and chooks, um, do, do they follow each other? I think you, you run your sheep and cattle together, but do you follow your chooks behind? What's the, what's the sequence? Yeah, so we do uh, run the sheep and cattle together. Uh, we've got to knock down, especially with the multi-species, if it gets away, you can't run the chooks through as a um, at full height because you just lose eggs in the... They just go and lay eggs wherever they like. So, um, so the aim is obviously to put the sheep and cattle over, graze it down to about a stubby and then put the chooks over it. And then the density of the chooks, they come through and scratch through the manure of the sheep and cattle. We limit the um, fly pressure, which comes with um, cattle manure if you don't have dung beetles, which we're still in the process of getting and still in the process of, of, of coming into. Um, so, yeah, so sheep and cattle together, then chooks over the top. Um, and uh, just then, of course, the density of the chooks help manure and enhance the soil behind. Um, and, yeah, we, we have a it's, a, it's a good system. It works well. It's getting better plenty of things to iron out but it's getting better yeah ah, very good um so disease have have you found uh bruce is asking is there any problems with disease i'll, I'll touch on that one first myself uh, i do do a bit of work with uh, some dairy farmers around here and what we have found by improving the grazing management and the uh, nutrient cycling and water cycling all those sorts of things um the vet bill goes down yep. almost Every time I talk to someone about it, it, it goes down like this. Uh, one fellow out the road, his vet bill was in the hundreds of thousands and now it's down in the thousands. So, um, yeah, it really does make a difference, I think, to uh, disease. Uh, you guys got any, any, any thoughts on that? From a parasite perspective, um, it's about that grazing height. So we're grazing higher than what the animals, the parasites have got up the plant. So... The, you know, internal parasites only go up about an inch or so. So if you're not grazing down at that level, they're not in, being ingested. Uh, and also you're breaking the life cycle of most worms. Some of the liver fluke you might, but um, you yeah, basically a lot of the internal parasites, you're breaking that life cycle with, you know, once you go over sort of 30, 40 day rest period, um, then yeah, most worms are being broken. There's a few exceptions here and there, but basically, yeah, I think coupled that with um, some high quality feed, nutrient dense feed, well, you, you really, you're covering a lot of bases. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I just wanted to go back to, oh, what was the app called, uh, Michael, that you used for working out your... Um, uh, yeah, I'll just look it up. Well, could I've, you got an Android, I've got an Android phone, and yeah. it's called um, Field Area Measure. Yeah, so yeah, it's, we might yeah. write that down, and we might just put that on the on the um, email when we send this out so people can have a look at it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not, yeah, there'd probably be other ones around, um, but yep. it works well for me. Yeah, it's just, it is what it is. Yep. Yeah, no, all these things, all these te technology is really good to, to help us for sure, I think. Um, so the other one in wet times, is there a, do you run into any issues with the uh, high density in the wet times or do you have, how do you manage that? Yeah, you just, yeah, you do. Don't do it, is the short yeah. answer. 
So yeah, yeah, you just got to, you know, yeah, we're not, <laughs> yeah, we don't work miracles. So you just, yeah, I would just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you just give them more space, let them move out, or we have a sacrifice area, or it could well, be any we, number of things. We probably find um, this year is a little bit unusual. Things got wet for us there pretty wet like about 10, 15 days ago and we just started giving the area a bit, a bit bigger area. Um, yeah, we're getting growth though too. It's unusual how much growth we're getting this time of year. So for in our situation, I'm happy to be moving a little bit quicker than what we would normally be because we're getting that recovery coming back around the other way. Like usually this time of year, we'd be probably out onto a 90 day recovery and then we're back to sort of 35, 40 because it's just growing so quickly. So yeah. that's, yeah, it's just how it's going at the moment. Yeah. Zoe, do you, what do you do? Uh, yeah, big... same. Yeah, look, we, we, uh, we just give them bigger area and move them faster. I think that rather than doing, um, say, a four or five day uh, changeover, we bring it back to maybe even two and just... Uh, you know, increase the size. And, and again, like Michael said, the growth, it's all about the growth time and then the rest period. So if you've got really wet patches, just don't put them there if you can avoid it, really. That's the key. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Michael, I know, uh, I think Jim Gerrish, I was at a talk that he did and you were there too. Um, can you explain maybe how you could just use your water sources as uh, an ability of grazing your paddocks? Uh, I know they were talking about large areas because of that that three to eight hundred meter around the the water source that cattle tend not to leave that. So um, yeah, just for people who've got that larger area that may might not be able to um, yeah put those fences up in a hurry. Yeah, I just don't exactly understand what you're saying. So by having by putting in more watering points or or yeah, so so he was saying at uh, I think at Wagga I think it was um, what they were doing over um on the ranches over in the states yep. or wherever they would actually turn a water point off to draw the cattle to the next water point and their water points were sort of 1600 meters apart because i think that 800 meter mark was as far as they would they would go in those in that environment yeah that distance of water is a big thing probably you know i wouldn't want to go any more than 500 meters um depending on the landscape like i was out at Wanneering yesterday and the fellow out there was talking about two Ks. I, I would think that was probably a bit too far anyway. Um, but yeah, by having that controlled water, um, certainly, you know, the animals will have to go there. Uh, and also by having access to more water will increase your utilisation because the water and the past utilisation goes hand in hand. If you're getting under utilisation because um, of your water source, well, then, you know, you're wasting a fair bit of that resource. Uh, and you're probably getting that overgrazing on the other side where the water is too. Um, so yeah, being able to control that. I mean, at the scale that we operate at, that we 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 can move around very quickly. So that's not really an issue. Um, although before we went and put our reticulated water system in, we had these areas that you know were all really grazed around the traditional dam areas, nutrient transfer going back to those areas and all that. And now that's all disappeared because um, the stock they hardly use the. All I do is use the dam to play in, really. Yeah. We've got a couple of dams just just in case we do have an issue. Like if we have a stock water issue, we've got a couple of dams we just keep water in in case the pump decides to blow up on Christmas Eve or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Uh, so this one, Susie Bates, on uh, a bit on the covers. So I know, Michael, you grazed yours pretty heavy and then sowed. Um, uh, did you need to like do a do a knock down on the um, existing pastures before you sow your cover crops? Because what they've found this year is they've been out competed by the existing pastures. Mm. So. Well, I, yeah, I can really only speak about our own situation, and we just did graze them. And what we did is we grazed it pretty hard for about five days, um, and then like when I say pretty hard, probably like um say 130 cows in like three hectares for five days um and then we came back about 15 days later did the same thing and then came back another 15 days later and did the same thing and by the time we did that like in all honesty it almost looked like we'd worked the paddock up like it was and i suppose for me it was a real ad for how 
damaging that set stocking is like because we don't usually do it and by going back letting that plant recover getting up you know three or four centimeters and then going back and smashing it it was literally like we'd knocked it down um i probably I need to get some photos of it i've got a photo of the day the guy sewed it and it, it literally looks like it's been sprayed out in this paddock um, but you know we were we were pretty mindful in managing that pretty solidly to go back, keep going back, going back, and we were happy with the class of stock. We were doing that in May last year, so we had cows that were coming up to calving, so we we're happy to sort of bash them around a little bit um, to do that. You wouldn't want to be doing that, you know, with lambs at foot or you know weaner steers that you're trying to put on a kilo a day or something like that. So you just have to be mindful of it, uh, I suppose. Yeah, and use your livestock as a tool. Yeah. Zoe, what did you what what do you do? Like, um, I'll, I'll give my point of view first. I've covered a lot of these things, but when you're first starting out the process, quite often you do need to go and take out the existing um, uh, pasture with a with a chem with chemistry, uh, just so you can get the get the ball rolling. But as your soil gets better and your management gets better and your thoughts get better. Um, then you can utilize your livestock better and you've got uh, and and you can just drill straight in. That's what I've noticed over from the time that I've been uh, playing around with these cover crops. So Zoe, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so we uh, we had a massive erodium bank, so obviously uh, low calcium. So um, we had paddocks we couldn't even put sheep in because of the, the corkscrew issue. Uh, so it was a uh, no-brainer for us. We had to knock it out in order to uh, let anything else grow. Um, so uh, now we've been able to, so this is our second year, we've been able to drop it back. Uh, our rates back with a with a knockdown and the biological like the stimulants and also using fulvic uh, has been a huge huge change so instead of uh, I think we're at 1.8 or 1.5 liters a hectare I think we're down to 800 to a, a liter so yeah so we're going it's it's really good it, it's yeah we and we've seen a massive change wherever we've we've sown a multi species and used the biostimulant we have no erodium. So we've obviously uh, done something underneath. So it's pretty yeah. exciting to see. <laughs> yeah. So that brings me to Greg's um, uh, comment. Do, do you monitor below ground as well as above ground? Yep. I know I do. Yeah. 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 I, um, I carry a shovel on the buggy in the ute. Uh, we actually try not to drive around the paddocks in our utes anymore. Uh, we've, we've got a buggy that we get around in just to take that um you know that that compaction away uh so yeah and you can just jump out and 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 dig a sword and have a look and it tells you so much it's such an interesting uh you know an interesting thing to do uh, yesterday we had a dig two different paddocks over the fence literally 40 meters apart one paddock had 15 worms in it the other paddock had none so you know that tells us so much uh just you know in, in what we've done um, and it, I guess it, it gives us the pat on the back to say, yes, you're still doing the right thing. Keep going. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I remember when we first went and dug in that paddock where you put the, the mouldy species. I don't think we could even get the shovel in the ground. So, um, yeah. And now it goes in the whole way, Luke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and there, Greg, there are lots of um, baselines that you can do. And um, like Graham Shepherd has one. Uh, soil land food has one. I have a basic um, bit of paper that I fill out when I do a, a soil health assessment. And I think um, um, I think that's a really important thing to do because you need to measure your improvement as well. So, and regardless of whether you're doing grazing, cropping, um, using a worm juice, using a biostimulant, whatever you do, if you don't measure, you don't know. So great question. Um, hey Luke, I've just um, I've just found these photos here. If you want me to share them about that paddy prep from last year, yeah, go for it. I'll just rip them up. See what happens here. Um, this is the day it was sown. Now, before people have a heart attack, that's not our machine. That's a contractor. <laughs> um, and he, I, yeah, he had a um, was a knife point press drill machine. Um, now, I'll just see, I've got to get that to flip sides. 
and then that's the actual paddock like a couple of days later. So it looks like it's been sprayed out, but that wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't sprayed at all. It was just um, three grazings, three big heavy grazings in about 35, 40 days um, is all that it was. Yeah, oh, fantastic. I don't know. Um, any bogging issues around your troughs, um, Michael? What, what have I you done? get a little bit, but they're only there, like all this stuff, they're there for like two or three days and then they're not there yeah. for 60. Um, and I have, there's a few harder spots around our trough, like our hydrants, but I probably, you've got probably four or five different, because the trough only takes up a metre. So if you move it over two metres, the next time you come along, like I've got a 10 metre lead out hose on it. So you've got a little bit of room to move where it, where you pull it in. Um, and then, you know, not every hydrant gets used every time. So if we're on five hectare grazers, we're skipping a couple of hydrants. And so if I drive past one hydrant, it doesn't look great from last time, I'll hook the water trough on the next one. So just, yeah, you just play it by ear a little bit. And yeah, um, yeah it's yeah. a recovery that really helps, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve Stone uh, was just wondering, has your grazing, uh, has your carrying capacity increased um, with the intensive grazing? Uh, well, in our situation, I would say that our DSC per hectare probably hasn't gone up since we've been doing this, but what has changed is we're not feeding, the we used to feed for six months of the year, so either barley or hay. So. Yep. We did do some confinement feeding in the last drought, and that was, you know, pretty planned and um, really only to because we had, you know, our stud cows type of thing. Um, but yeah, so our our carrying capacity hasn't technically gone up, but you know, our the feeding that we do and certainly our profitability has gone up, and that's probably the measure that we that we really want to be looking at. I would agree. I would agree with that. Our carrying capacity hasn't gone up, but we were the same, Michael. We would we would feed for six months, probably eight months sometimes of the year. Uh, whereas now we we cut a, a paddock for hay and I I we fed for about a month and a half this year. So and and we still have hay in reserve. So yeah. Uh, yeah, um Michael, with the electric fencing, do you have any troubles with shorting out and those sorts of things or um, like with the livestock knocking it or shorting out on long grass, any of those sorts of things? Uh, not a lot. The long grass, sometimes you have to run the four-wheeler over the top of the area and then run it back again to knock it down. Uh, I'd probably be asking about your, you know, matching stocking rate to carrying capacity if that was going on too much, probably. Um, and then with the one wire, it's very good. The two wires was a little bit of a problem. We didn't have sheep at that time of year when the grass started to get up. So, yeah, it's usually not a huge drama. But in saying that, we've got we put a fair bit of effort in. We've got, you know, the, the biggest Gallagher um, re Earth Return mains powered energizer. And then we designed our energizer system very similar to stock water. So we've got like 4.2 mil wire going out at the start and then big um, underground cable, aluminium coated underground cable, lead out cables and they're all trenched in and um, fitted off. And so it's, I would like to think that, that we're getting, you know, most of the time we sort of get 10 to 13 um, kilowatts out on the line. Um, and then, so it's, it's, it's proper hot, like yeah, yeah. it builds you. So don't step, don't step over your fences no, is what you're saying. Not. No, no. It, <laughs> I'm scared out of the hell out of them, and uh, I don't know what the cattle think because they don't know that it's energised, and they oh yeah, it must be yeah, it's a psychological thing for them. They just don't go near it. Yeah, yeah, oh, fantastic. Um, so Sam Kelly was just up wondering whether you've um, experimented with other minerals uh, with the cattle other than salt, or does the diverse range of species uh, fit your needs? We've done a few different things uh, over the years. We've tried some of the Pat Colby uh, mix, free choice minerals. We've provided blocks, um, like just a you know compressed block. I it's really hard to get 
a measure on you know the cost benefit of doing these types of things. I like to keep things simple. Uh, the the Himalayan rock salt uh, ticks the box for me with that. It's 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 relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, you know, it's yeah. We just keep it there available all year round. Um, yeah. The other thing too, that I'm really keen with the Himalayan rock salt is that then when coming into that, if we come into that drier time and we do need to get the animals on the um, higher urea blocks, uh, like we use the Terry Makoska brew, um, if we need, need to introduce them to that, uh, we can do that quite quickly because we know that their cro salt craving has been satisfied. So we're happy to jump in with, you know, 12% urea like straight away um, and ramp it up to 30% within, you know, 14 days because the cattle have got those that trace mineral, so they're not they're chasing the urea, not necessarily any other trace. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think too, um, salt, even a good quality sea salt, uh, it's got it's got all the elements in it. It's got a lot of stuff in it. So and and I think we get a little bit carried away with having too much um, animals and plants and that they only need little bits of all of these things. So yeah, you don't want to overdo it, and and they'll tell you when you when you've uh, done the right thing or not anyway, won't they? So, <laughs> yeah. How are we going for time, um, Jess? Yeah, pretty good. We're probably the first webinar we've stayed in time, to be honest. So. Yep. <laughs> um, right. Up. I, think, I think one thing I'll add with the mineral thing is um, there's a really great book uh, that Fred, Fred Preventer has got out, Nourishment, and that will just really give you an appreciation, respect for the wisdom of the animal you know, let them just sort of decide what they need and, and their ability to self-medicate is phenomenal. I think we, yeah, we underestimate um, how much they'll they'll choose what they need if you sort of have got it on offer. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think there's a fair bit in all that that, you know, you need to sort of respect and acknowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other one I'd like to touch on with the, with the minerals as well Um after you sort of go down this path for a while and, and your soil cycling better and you've got better mineral cycling, the need for supplement is, is less. So I'll give an example of that dairy farm I spoke about earlier. His, his um, supplements that he used to put in the bale was about eighty to $100,000 a year. Now he's down to that sort of $20,000 a year point that he's, that he's putting in um, for, for supplements in the bale. So it can make a big difference once you get that nutrient cycling going and the plants are healthier and photosynthesizing better and 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 um yeah it just makes a huge difference so yeah yeah there's just a, another question here we might touch on um from john that we kind of missed but what kind of approach do you guys have when it's a drier period or a drought yeah well for us uh yeah we will there's a few things with the drought, you know, it becomes an economic decision of what you're going to do. Probably, you know, first and foremost, my, my mantra would be to hate cows and love grass. Uh, and so in matching our stocking rate to current capacity, we did feed in 2019 because, um, yeah, we were in the throes of a developing an anger stud and we had some genetics there that we felt, like everyone else in Australia, felt that they were too good to get rid of. So we, but we got down to sort of um, a third of our long-term carrying capacity and then did a budget up, bought some barley straw from a neighbour and, you know, we were prepared to feed for 180 days. Probably in hindsight, the best thing about starting to feed was that it started to rain. So, um, yeah, that, you know, we got about 60 days in and it, and it was raining. So by the time we put cattle out, um, yeah, we had really good feed. Uh, if we are going to feed... It's got to be economical. You've got to be feeding for production, not feeding for maintenance. Um, you know, not be in the position where you're just writing out a blank check to say, right, oh, we're just going to feed to the drought breaks, feed for a set period of time and make sure it's profitable to do so, I think would be uh, my yeah, take on it. Um, yeah, unless you just want to throw money away, that's 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 what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Zo Zoe, you got any thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, look, we, uh, and my sentiments exactly, uh, we do have a stand of salt bush uh, that we have used in the past uh, when it's come in dry. Obviously, um, we sell anything if it's, you know, if we're, if it's looking like we're going to run into a bit of dry, obviously anything that's not useful to us 
needs to go. Uh, in other words, you know, merino weather lambs or, you know, anything, any culls, everything, you know, obviously leaves that isn't worth keeping. Uh, and then we do a budget on what, how long we know that stand of salt bush can run them and then whether or not we are prepared to buy in feed or whether we run a sacrificial paddock and containment feed for a certain amount of time. But again, it has to be, um, it has to be productive. We're not going to just throw money at them for the sake of it. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much how we run. Yep. So um, Brad Fleming's asked a question. I'll ask this one of you first, Zoe. Um, so going from a cover crop back to a perennial pasture, sort of how many species do you think that you need to run? Um, like grasses, legumes, uh, forbs and chicory? Because um, Brad finds that, um, that some of those things won't persist in their environment. Um, okay. So what's your, what's your thoughts on what you're going to do? So I feel as our... Um, we, we have that... that <coughs> exact thing is said quite a lot around here that people sow their rise and their clovers and then wonder why they haven't persisted for the next five years. Um, one, because of uh, incorrect grazing. Two, uh, they actually haven't um, fixed the problem, which is uh, um, a lack of a, of a biological system in their soil. So I guess uh, my answer to that would be We've already seen a huge change in our um, in our soil. Uh, we've been uh, putting in biostimulants and feeding the soil uh, for probably three years, uh, and that um, has already changed our uh, different plant species that we are seeing. Like I said in my presentation, we had plantain pop up, which we we don't have plantain here we've never sown it so obviously there is something there um there's there's 40,000 seeds in a square foot of soil at any one time uh if your biological system is right those plants that should persist because you have because seeds are successional uh as you increase your um your soil health the better plant species will stay on. So it's more about increasing your soil health and making sure that you get that right and then worrying about what plants will come along later on. As far as diversity is concerned, look, we are, we are putting out a grass seed every time we sow a multi-species. We might put out two or three because we don't want to turn around and and spend a heap of money on grass seeds and then have it fail, obviously, because it's a lot of money. Uh, so the idea is obviously that we'll put out one or two and they will persist in the, in, in my opinion, they will persist because we are increasing our soil health and grazing it correctly as we're going along. So I guess that's, that's pretty much, uh, that's my take on it. So, yeah. Yep. Michael, you got any thoughts on that one? No, it was really great answer, Zoe. I think the understanding that plant succession is really important, that fungi to bacteria ratio. And so once you get that back to more, you know, equal one to one, then that you'll transition to that higher order succession of plant. Um, the other part too is the grazing management's just got so, that's the big key to allowing those higher succession plants to be able to one, germinate, and then two, you know, survive in the, in the pasture sward. So typically, you know, a lot of guys up this way were sort of saying loosen and chicory and everyone was saying that the chicory wouldn't persist in the pastures. The chicory for us is a weed now. It's just everywhere. And it's because we're allowing it to, to grow. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it will persist if you have the right grazing management over the top. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so, Kieran has asked, uh, what biostimulants do you use, Zoe, and how much fulvic acid per hectare did you use? Uh, so we run um, the TM program here through uh, with Best Farming. So basically, um, yeah, so TM Ag is our go-to. Um, and then uh, Fulvic goes out at 250 mil a hectare. Um, so that is, uh, we've done two of them in the early growing season. So late March and then again only a month ago. Uh, and then uh, we'll do a foliar fert over the multi-species um a sort of tm folia over um one when we can get back on the paddocks uh hopefully that will be uh probably the end of august mid-september uh and once we hit september 
basically then that's obviously our peak growing season once the sun comes out the ground starts to warm up so we will probably do a couple of foliar ferts we also use nutrisoil uh on occasions um so yeah we, we've just found that uh we've come ahead in leaps and bounds where we have used the biostimulants i guess so uh it's it's been um quite incredible yeah, I think uh, one thing to think about with the folic acid uh, is how much you use. It depends on the product that you've got. So some of them are like a 4% solution. Some of them are 8% solution. Some of them are, are um, uh, a 20% solution and higher. And um, and it's important to use a really good, like the better the quality, the less you need. So um, I know the, the um, Fulvic Plus from Best, that's only 250 mils, whereas some of the other ones might be a litre or two litres a, a hectare. So it just depends on what you've got your hands on at the time. So um, I think that's really important. Um, so one other thing I'd like to touch on, um, I've got another couple of things. So uh, you, you did touch on this, Michael, uh, quickly, but why leave leaf behind? Or like, Why is that so important? Yeah, well, leaf grows leaf is the short answer. So it's, it's that photosynthetic capacity of the plant. Um, if you take the plant back to like nothing, then it's got to use those root reserves to grow and that takes a lot more energy and time. So if, you, if you're if leaving a proportion of the leaf, sort of 30%, 50% of the leaf, then the, the plant will just keep growing quicker. Um, and we've... Like I've done this so many times sort of by mistake now that you just see, you can see it in the paddocks those where every now and then where we take a paddock back too far and the recovery period of it is just longer and longer uh, all the time. So it really just shows that like how much, how much more production we get out of by leaving that extra leaf. You know, it's probably, yeah, 30, 40% more I would uh, argue that we get out of it. Um, we're not going to utilize all of it all the time because we always we're always wanting to keep that that leaf there. So, you know, when those, especially this time of year, when those annuals sort of die down in the late spring time, they'll go down and they'll provide our ground cover of that mulch layer that we want for our summer as summer grasses come through. And then, you know, that sort of happens again the other time in the autumn, then they'll frost out and they'll break down and provide that cover for the for the um, winter. So it's that cycling the whole time. Yeah. No. Fantastic, that's for sure. Um, and and the other one, why the high density? Like, can you just explain the high density short time and 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 the reasoning behind it a bit more? Yeah, good question. Um, I suppose it gets down to the energy that the animals provide. So that stimulation, the impact, the animal impact of the hooves that um, you know indiscriminately grazing, indiscriminate like treading on plants, um, the urine, the defecation. Uh, that type of impact uh, stimulates the plants above and the soil biology below. Uh, I think there's an energy that's created within the mob as well, uh, sort of a competitiveness, um, which, yeah, you've got to be mindful about it. You've got to make sure you've got the animals in the right frame of mind and you've got yourself in the right frame of mind when you start doing this um, more intensely because, yeah, we've seen probably, you know, some really big disasters with the high density and then also we've seen some really great results. So... Um, I don't know the exact science behind it all, how it all works, but it's it's in and around the energy that's provided from the from the animals, uh, the, the stimulation of the plants, and the biology that's that's stimulated at a below ground. Um, and I'll just add to that, if that's okay, Luke. The uh, what Michael's saying uh, around the mob um, mind, they they tend to take on a different. Um, uh, attitude even uh, and and you know I, I know I know blokes that have got stock that if you get to the gate they hit the fence on the other side as soon as you and they say oh there's no way I can do that uh, you know what you do but once you start your stock and, and it's sheep or cattle it doesn't matter once you start your sheep or cattle into that system they then get to know that rotation and, and they then get to look for you and then you become the source of their food uh, and you do gain a better relationship with your stock. Uh, but frame of mind is so important because if you if you don't have your mind on the job in that case, you don't have you won't have the right effect on your stock. So I think that's a super important thing to keep in mind. Yep. Intention is everything when you go out Absolutely. with stock, I think. Yes. 
Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really disappointed, Zoe. You didn't throw up a picture of your tyres. I just love, <laughs> I love how you've just thought outside the box there, and you haven't let not having something stop you from moving forward with that. And I think that's a really important lesson. Um, but anyway, I think that's all the questions, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, yes. that's really good. So like, you know, thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate your knowledge that you have. And and also we love being able to bring this knowledge to you guys and, and your support really is what makes it possible for us to keep keep putting on these webinars. So thank you very much. Thank you. No worries. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, thank, thanks, Zoe. Yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity to be able to, um, yeah, to explain what we do. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. It's been great to, um, yeah, to have a chat about it all. Good. Yeah. So right. just probably one thing I'd like to say, if you've got any real questions about grazing management or anything like that, send us an email um, or a message. We can put you in touch with Michael or, or Zoe and, um, and, and, and myself and talk you through it a bit. I'm definitely no expert, but um, we can help you get started and, and move you in the right direction. Anyway, thanks very much, yeah. everybody, and uh, I hope you all got something out of it. Yeah, great point, Luke. Yeah, we'll hopefully see you at the next one. Fantastic. See you thanks guys. guys. <laughs> thanks.